Good afternoon, and welcome to this afternoon's webcast, Data-Driven Maintenance, Follow the Numbers to the Right Strategy, sponsored by Prooftechnic and Deskcase. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bob Aber, Content Manager for Plan Engineering. Welcome to this afternoon's webcast. Plan Engineering has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RCEP at rcep.net. Certificate of completion will be issued to each participant. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by RCEP. Here are some tips to help you get the most from this afternoon's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or the audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with the audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark in the top right-hand corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Type questions for our speaker in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen and the Q&A session will begin immediately after this afternoon's presentation concludes. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of the presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left-hand side of your screen. These documents will also will be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. Here's an overview of this afternoon's webcast. And among the issues we'll be covering today are an explanation of how repair processes affect order efficiency and reliability, a description of the best practices, best repair practices to maintain or improve efficiency, and an overview of the ESA accreditation program for service centers to prove compliance with good practice repairs via third-party auditing. This event is a live educational webcast presented on April 16, 2019, and the educational category is Technical Health and Safety. Now we'll hear a word from our sponsors for today's webcast, Prooftechnic and Deskcase. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. Prooftechnic have been setting new standards in machine and shaft alignment for more than 35 years. Now, it is time to introduce the cutting edge sensor line family, the laser sensor measurement technology that makes the difference in shaft alignment. The distance between the laser and sensor can be either set down to zero millimeters or even up to 10 meters. This high performance technology guarantees precision and repeatability. Proof Technic sensor line technology is able to measure shaft angularity and offset in one single shaft rotation. Rotoline Touch is featuring the high performance sensor line 7 laser sensor heads, including all Proof Technic intelligent shaft alignment features, such as the advanced multi coupling measurement and live move of up to six shaft couplings at a time. Optiline Touch is equipped with the powerful sensor line 5 laser sensor technology. This alignment device is the latest standard in every maintenance workshop. It can be easily upgraded with a Sensorline 7 laser sensor unit for full access to Proof Technic intelligent alignment features. Your manufacturing line runs like a well-oiled machine because, well, it's made up of well-oiled machines. But what happens when they aren't oiled so well? Well, they break down. Did you know that when oil arrives at your facility, it's already been contaminated with dirt particles and water? And that a particle as small as 5 microns can bring your manufacturing floor to a screaming halt? 5 microns! That's one-tenth the size of a human hair. Gas Case's wide range of products filter out these pesky particles and moisture, keeping oil clean from the moment it arrives and is stored at your facility, during transfer and handling, and while in use on your equipment. This means more uptime on your factory floor and less spending on oil and machine repair. No matter your industry, Desk Case has a solution for you. Discover the value Desk Case brings to your manufacturing process by visiting our website today.
We're really pleased to have Evan Zabowski with us this afternoon for today's webcast. Evan's a certified lubrication specialist with test oil, with diplomas in chemical engineering and fourth class power engineering. He's got extensive experience training tradesmen and professionals in a variety of fields, including lubrication fundamentals, contamination control, condition monitoring, RCM, FMEA, and used oil analysis. He's been a member of the Society for Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers for more than 19 years, serving as chair of the Alberta section for eight years, and also as an instructor of the condition monitoring course at STLE annual meetings. He's been the editor of TLT Magazine for the last eight years and has served as editor of the STLE Alberta Section Basic Handbook of Lubrication, third edition, and contributed as one of the editors for STLE CRC's Handbook of Lubrication and Tribology, Volume 2, Theory and Design, second edition. That's a lot of stuff that uh, Evan's in, involved with, and we are really pleased to have him on this afternoon's webcast. Evan, welcome and good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, Bob. Thanks for having me. Today's presentation, uh, Data-Driven Maintenance, is more or less about uh, different types of maintenance strategies leading us to the discussion on uh, reliability-centered maintenance. So with the presentation, I'm going to kind of bookend it with a little bit of history. So starting us off, just a quick walkthrough of uh, how we've defined over the years the probability of failure. In the very early years, we thought there was really only one way things failed, and it was that they mostly just eventually wore out. Well, around World War II, we started going through a bit of a revolution there, and we started thinking of things a bit differently. And this is where we divided it into three groupings. And these three groupings ultimately got summarized as the bathtub curve. And I'm going to talk a little bit at length about the bathtub curve and, and why it's not very good uh, in terms of picturing how things fail. But where we are today, which is where I'll lead the presentation, is going beyond the bathtub curve. So with the bathtub curve, as we've all heard it called and probably seen examples of it, we have an observed failure rate that is high at the beginning, low through the middle, and high at the end. What many of us don't realize about this particular curve is that it is actually the sum total of three separate curves. So let me just quickly walk us through each of the three curves um, just for some uh, background information. The first curve is one we usually refer to as the early failure curve or an infant mortality curve. And it just implies that when a part is new, it has a higher probability of failure than is normal that quickly dissipates to a very low probability of failure mode and never returns. The middle one is usually referred to as constant or random, and it's got a slightly elevated probability of failure, but it remains, of course, constant. And this is where we get the term random failure because it just means it could fail at any moment in time, so we more or less assign that to be random. The last of the three curves is the one that's typically referred to as a wear-out curve. I prefer the terms time and condition dependent because usually that's the trigger to the inflection on the curve. But it begins with a very low probability of failure that increases slowly over time, but at some point reaches a very strong inflection point and the probability increases dramatically. Now, those three curves, as I said, are summarized together as one final curve, the bathtub curve. And this bathtub curve is the, the representation of the three put together. And many of us mistakenly assign the bathtub curve or just group things under the bathtub curve because it fits part of the curve, essentially one of the three independent curves, not because it fits the whole pattern. A good example would be something like a light bulb. We all know that light bulbs eventually burn out. They more or less fit the wear out curve. But we often say, well, it failed near the end of its life. It had a high probability of failure. It fit the bathtub curve. Well, no, it only fit part of the bathtub curve. Light bulbs don't typically have a high probability of failure when they're brand new. That would imply an infant mortality. If they did, and then that probability decreased only to return later, then truly we would say it fit the bathtub curve. And this is something that was seen in the next revolution that we had with understanding probability of failures. Where we sit presently is based on some 
uh, investigations and publications that occurred throughout the 1960s and eventually culminated into about the mid 70s. And with the publications, we now define probability in six different categories. So you see the six listed here. Basically, they fall into two distinct groups. The first group is ones referred to as age related. And this is where we throw in the bathtub curve and that wear up curve, but we added one more curve, the fatigue. And it just means that we have an ever so slightly increasing probability of failure throughout the life of the component. It starts slightly elevated and only continues to rise, but there's no inflection on this one. The other three are non-age related, meaning that at the end of their life, the probability did not increase. It is in fact flat. So here we have the same infant mortality curve and the random or constant curve that we saw make up part of the bathtub curve, but we added one more, which was the initial break-in. And this one's the inverse of the infant mortality. Now where this all gets kind of interesting in the history behind it is that during the investigations in the 60s and through the early 70s, two different organizations um, presented some data and assigned these six probabilities of failure to the failures they observed. The first group was uh, United Airlines, and they had two engineers working absolutely independently from each other, one by the last name of Nolan, the other one by the last name of Heap. And Nolan and Heap together published one of the landmark documents I'm gonna show you later. But what was interesting is just a few years after they published their data, a Swedish airline also published similar data that agreed to within about one to 2% of their data, which is a remarkable comparison. So let me show you uh, those two sets of data, and then I'll talk about the third set that exists here. So what Nolan and Heap and uh, the Swedish airline discovered was very, very few failures actually fit the bathtub curve, meaning that they had to have a high infant mortality rate, a decreasing rate of probability, and that would eventually return as a wearout rate. Very few fit that bathtub curve. Very few fit the wearout curve. A little bit fit the fatigue and the initial break-in uh, curves, but they actually found that really, if you're going to assign one, random was more common than all the previous four put together, but the bulk of it all fit under infant mortality. That was their big revelation. They said most things had a high probability of failure when new, and if you overcame that, generally speaking, it was smooth sailing from there. Now, about a decade after this information was published, another group, US Navy, took their data and presented it in the same six categories. And that is the last set of columns that you'll see here. And you notice again, there was absolute agreement. Not much fits the bathtub curve. Very little fits the fatigue curve. But what they did was they took a little bit away from infant mortality and put it into the wear out uh, curve section, but they assigned a lot more to random. So there's a bit of a discrepancy between some of the data, but the universal agreement here was bathtub curve doesn't work. Most things don't fit the bathtub curve. And if you're going to pick your number one or number two most common uh, curve to, to use, it should be the infant mortality curve. So that's our, our quick little bit of history here. Now, let me get into the, the meat of the presentation with an explanation of the various maintenance strategies. Now, as a quick overview, we've probably all heard these before, the, the four most common being uh, termed reactive, preventive, predictive, and proactive. Reactive, we usually refer to as run to failure, and preventive, we usually refer to as schedule-based. Predictive is where we think a lot of condition monitoring occurs, and proactive means that we learn from past mistakes and we move forward from there in a way to try and reduce uh, future failures. But let's get into a little bit more depth behind these and understand exactly what each one is and sort of where it's best to spend our money. So first off is reactive maintenance. And like I said, normally we call this one run to failure or breakdown. Um, basically the mentality is that do nothing until it breaks and when it breaks, fix it. And it's been said before, and I thought this was a good quote, that calling it maintenance is really a misnomer because it's not maintenance, it's only repair. You have not maintained it, you've repaired it or replaced it. Now, even though it sounds fairly negative, it does have its places. The advantages of reactive maintenance is in doing nothing, it tends to cost you very little most of the time. So you spend a lot less on parts, you spend a lot less on labor, you don't, probably don't even need that many staff on hand. Disadvantages are is that when it fails, it starts to cost you a lot, cost you in time, cost you money. You've got an unexpected downtime, which of course never occurs in the middle of the weekday, 
it always occurs at night or on a weekend. So your labor costs go up, your shipping costs to get parts goes up, and, and, and. It's not a very efficient usage of your plant personnel to do run to failure. Now, the next category, preventive maintenance, is usually called something like schedule-based maintenance. We, we typically abbreviate this to PM, and it's common to hear people use the term PMs when they say what they're doing to a piece of equipment. Many, many things in life we schedule in based on some type of schedule or event when we're going to redo some maintenance. So this one requires an interval of some definition. Now that may be a time interval, maybe a usage interval, maybe just a simply some type of event. And a classic example of this would be something like the batteries in your smoke detector. When do you check them? Well, typically we're told to check them when the clocks change. And if, if the clocks change twice a year, you've checked your batteries twice a year, that's usually considered a type of preventive maintenance. You haven't done anything to the batteries, but at least you performed a check to ensure that you know, the batteries seem to be in good order. Now, typically, once you're up there, you bring up your vacuum cleaner and you clean the, vac the smoke detector as well, and now that becomes an actual maintenance activity. Another example, though, that we don't often think of is your oil changes in your own vehicle. These are absolutely PM-based because, again, what's the interval? It's usually what's written in your OEM manual for mileage, or it's when the light on your dashboard comes on. And before anyone gets too quick to say, well, that now becomes condition maintenance, no, that is not a sensor-based light in your dashboard. Right? That's usually built with a math algorithm based on usage. So essentially, it's not measuring anything. It's only predicting it based on known factors for um, how fast we build up contaminants. It is simply a form of preventive maintenance. We're not allowing oil to get bad enough that it absolutely must be replaced. We're more or less doing a schedule to say you should be able to go this far before there's a problem. So with preventive maintenance, being that it's only scheduled, we have some different advantages and disadvantages. And one of the neat things though is that it's been estimated to cost less than reactive at least. So the main advantages are because we are actually scheduling everything and can do so in advance, we are better able to forecast parts and labor. We're better able to coordinate between operations and, and the maintenance departments. But the goal is to decrease downtime costs. We're trying to reduce the number of failures by replacing parts or at least performing maintenance before the part wants to fail. Now, the disadvantage is that we're actually now spending a lot more money on parts and maintenance than we were doing reactive maintenance. We're throwing away sometimes perfectly usable life in certain parts. But here's the kicker and why I went through the bit of history. We are introducing a lot more infant mortality. So that is one of the biggest reasons that preventive maintenance has been proven to not be the most effective form of maintenance in all types of assets, because at times it actually makes things worse. The other final point though, and this is absolutely key, is that you never completely eliminate all failures. And the best example I can give you is to go back to the light bulb example and say, we know light bulbs eventually wear out. If we buy light bulbs and they're rated for 2,000 hours, and we do the math on this and figure we run the light bulbs 10 hours a day, so we should get 200 days worth of light bulbs, and then we divide that by a five-day uh, work week, we go, okay, 40 weeks, we should have burnt out light bulbs. So we schedule the light bulbs to be replaced at 38 weeks. Well, you probably know for a fact, based on some light bulbs in your house, that, which you've never changed or haven't changed in years and years and years, that if you were to suddenly say after 38 weeks of standard usage, you went through your entire building and replaced every single light bulb, you'd be throwing away some perfectly good light bulbs. The other side of it is that you know that some of them may have burnt out before then. But, you know, if you're on a schedule, you just follow the schedule. So you don't eliminate all failures. There's still a chance that some failed randomly without reaching the normal expected end of life. But as I said, you've also introduced potentially a lot more infant mortality. So where people like to progress up the ladder here is to go to predictive maintenance. This is one of the most popular categories of maintenance for people to get interested in uh, is because there's a lot to it. We, we usually refer to this as condition-based maintenance, so you often hear it abbreviated as CBM. And what it means is that we're performing some type of measurements to uh, ascertain a condition and based on the condition, we're predicting when the part will fail. So this form of maintenance 
is estimated to cost even less than preventive maintenance. So this is uh, you know, even cheaper than reactive maintenance. And that's where a lot of people get interested in it because it has an even higher cost savings. But let's look at the advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are that we're not necessarily replacing perfectly good parts. We're only replacing the parts that we've predicted need replacing. So our parts and maintenance costs should go down. We're extending the life of some of the components because we are maintaining some form of measurement to them and saying as long as we get a good measurement, we will keep running it until such time as we think it needs to be replaced. So we're not throwing away useful life. And of course, we're going to decrease our downtime even further than preventive maintenance was doing. The disadvantage, though, is that there are significant costs involved in this. We now need to buy the tools to take the measurements. We need to train the people to take the data properly, to interpret the data. And of course, then we need to act on this data. So there are a lot of hidden costs in there that we don't necessarily realize until such time as we go down this path. But the other point is, again, we still never completely eliminate all failures. That's always something that we have to keep cognizant when we think about doing maintenance is that ultimately we're not always trying to reduce the number of failures sometimes we're only interested in reducing the severity of the failure right the failure will eventually occur one way or the other but the big question is can we predict it right are we anticipating it so when it comes to predictive maintenance one of the classic questions i get is what's the best tool well i work for an oil analysis lab so obviously i'm going to be a little biased towards oil analysis but I'd rather answer the question as what are the two best tools? And the two best tools typically, the ones that sort of mesh up the nicest, that support each other in the best possible way are oil analysis and vibration, which to be honest is, is being slightly replaced by ultrasonic or acoustic emission ultrasonics. But this uh, chart I got here from a very well-written article just illustrated what they felt were the strengths and weaknesses of each technology. And at times, both technologies are capable of doing the same thing, but there are certain times where only one technology really would work in that situation. And just look at the fourth and fifth lines of the, uh, of the table here. And we see that if we look at uh, machine imbalance, if the machine is out of balance, your vibration analysis or your acoustic emission ultrasonics would catch that within a few rotations. The only way oil analysis would know there was a problem is once the wear started to build. But if you go to the next line and you see if you had some sort of contamination in your oil, like water or particulate, again, oil analysis would catch this on the very first sample, whereas vibration or ultrasonics would have to wait for the damage to start setting in some type of wear pattern that would eventually lead to perhaps an imbalance and alignment issue or whatever it might be. So there's times where these two technologies complement each other, and there's times where these two technologies overlap. And that was part of the reason I chose this particular article to show you a little bit of information from, because they put together this pie chart, which was, uh, I thought, very interesting. Of all the machines that were being monitored, which you can see there were 750 machines, they felt oil analysis caught almost two-thirds of the expected failures. Vibration was only slightly less than about 57%. But what was more interesting was that they said 27% of the failures required both technologies to be certain a failure was going to happen. So you'll notice this adds up to more than 100% then. But the point is that sometimes one tool isn't enough. Two tools are better. Three tools are even better yet, and so on and so forth. But of course, we have a, a diminishing rate of return. So when we start to anticipate the cost of a program, we need to balance these costs. And that's kind of the best way of thinking about this. And so I threw together this quick slide just to show you what do the costs look like with those three types of maintenance strategies. When you have reactive maintenance, you're spending very little on maintenance itself, but you are suffering a high operational or downtime cost. The flip side is to go to preventive maintenance, which now your maintenance costs go up significantly because you're spending a lot of money replacing parts that maybe do or do not need replacing, but your downtime costs should be lower. But where you see the best benefit is to go to predictive maintenance, which is the balance in the middle there. That's where we're trying to balance just enough maintenance with just enough downtime costs so that the sum total of those two is actually slightly lower than either of the separate technologies, reactive or, or preventive, would be independently. So predictive maintenance tends to fall into that category of the, of the sweet spot that we're looking for. 
But as I said, there are four maintenance strategies, and a lot of people look at this and say, well, where would proactive fit in? Where's that fourth and final maintenance strategy? Is that the sweet spot? Is that where the two intersect? And the aggregate total cost there is at its lowest. And I would say that it's, it's probably close to there, but more importantly, it's not just where it is on that curve, it's that it pulls the curve down even further. Because the idea behind proactive maintenance is that what we're going to do is try to avoid the failures, and that's why we call it failure avoidance. Uh, normally, the way we phrase this is a never, ever, ever let it fail. But if it fails, don't let it fail the same way twice. Right? So we admit, again, that we can't prevent all failures, but what we're saying is we will learn from failures, and moving forward, we will prevent that failure from ever recurring. So this is where we can pull the cost even lower, because if you can prevent it from happening, you don't have to spend the money fixing it. Sort of that whole ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure statement. Now, the advantages of proactive maintenance is that we're greatly reducing the severity of the failure, not necessarily the number of failures, but the severity. We're not suffering as many bad failures. So our downtime decreases, and we should hopefully, if we're doing it right, have no recurrence of any previous failure patterns. The disadvantage, though, is to accomplish this, you do need to do whatever the acronym is you want to use, root cause analysis, failure modes effective analysis, or FEMICA, or any of those ones, you basically need to do some kind of post-mortem autopsy forensic investigation after a failure has occurred. And people don't like when this happens. It's disruptive production. And often people get quite defensive when you start asking them questions about, well, when was the last time you did this? And did you do this properly? And how can I verify that? And you're out there just trying to do basically a bit of an audit to make sure everything was done according to plan and then trying to see where the plan could be improved. But a lot of people just don't like when that happens. But the point is, is that doing it prevents the next failure from recurring exactly the same way. Maybe you get a new failure, but at least you don't get the same failure twice. Now, with these four maintenance strategies, trying to piece them all together in your head and understand how the four are absolutely separate from each other, but can be applied to the same type of uh, machine, I've given you a quick analogy here. Think of tires on your vehicle. Now, reactive maintenance would be you get a flat, you fix the tire. That is reactive maintenance. Something happened, you performed a repair. Preventive maintenance, though, imagine you bought a, a set of tires rated for 60,000 miles, and at 60,000 miles of driving, you replace the tires whether they needed it or not. Well, that would be preventive maintenance. Problem is, is that maybe your tires had more life left in them and you've just thrown that away. But the other side of it is, and again, I stress, you don't completely eliminate all failures, is in those 60,000 miles, there's a possibility you could have had a flat or could have had a, a tire failure. Right? Going based on a schedule only doesn't completely eliminate failures, but it does tend to balance how much maintenance uh, we're, we're doing and balance that with the downtime costs. Now, predictive maintenance would be doing some form of measurement. And one of the simplest measurements we can do on a tire is to measure the tread depth, right? You take out a penny and you see how far Lincoln's head goes down into the tread depths. And as long as some of Lincoln's head is below the tread, you've got the remaining useful life on your tires. If you can see the top of his head, that typically represents less than 230 seconds of tread left. And most people tell you at that point, you should replace your tires. So if you check your tires every month or every you know, quarter or something like that, and uh, perform these measurements, you can anticipate when your tires will need to be replaced and you're not necessarily going to run them to the absolute lowest uh, tread. That is a predictive model, right? You're predicting when the tire should be replaced. But proactive maintenance is a little bit different. Proactive maintenance is to continue doing the predictive maintenance. You're still taking measurements, you're still checking tread depth, but you've learned from past experience that keeping your tires properly inflated extends the life of your tires, reduces the wear. So now when you're checking your tread depth, you're also checking your tire pressure. But proactive maintenance could go even further. You could realize that by balancing your wheels, you get less wear. By checking the alignment on your vehicle, you will get less wear. And by rotating your tires, you will spread the wear. And if you start adding in each one of these activities to your vehicle's maintenance schedule, Though it seems like preventive maintenance because it's now scheduled that you bring it in after so many months or so many miles to do these type of activities of rotations, alignments, whatever it might be, it is a form of proactive maintenance because the only reason you're doing them is from past experience. 
that's the key behind proactive maintenance is that we're essentially kind of meshing in a little bit of preventive with predictive and saying, I know these to be the best actions I should do. I'm not simply doing them because there's a schedule and I'm not simply taking measurements. I'm combining everything into sort of an overlying maintenance strategy. Now, just to summarize those four real quick from a different perspective, um, I was showing you how the costs decreased from one technology to another. Here's a different study that I got from Pump Magazine that reiterates exactly the same point, that reactive is among the costliest forms of maintenance strategies you can employ, whereas preventive is slightly cheaper, predictive cheaper yet, and proactive ends up, in the sum total, costing you the least. But where this was interesting was from another study that I managed to dig up here, and it suggested that when uh, interviewed, many, many industries out there admitted they've mostly followed reactive maintenance, the most expensive maintenance strategy there is. But funnily enough, though we know it's cheaper, most people do the more expensive option. And I quite like this quote here. It says, too many companies inaccurately think maintenance, repair, and operations consists solely of waiting for an asset to go down and then fixing or replacing it. Right? Reactive maintenance, if it's broken, fix it. We need something better than just understanding there are four maintenance strategies and that the one we do the most is often the one that costs us the most. So as I stressed at the beginning, we went through an, a bit of a revolution here through the 60s and into the mid 70s. And during this revolution, we came up with a new term. And that's kind of the, the second part of the presentation here is about RCM, reliability centered maintenance. And it's got a bit of an interesting history that started during the Second World War, actually, but didn't cause that second revolution. So during the Second World War, we had some issues. One issue was uh, by the Royal Air Force. They had some problems sinking German submarines. So they created a, a bit of a group here to do some investigations in it. So they hired a scientific advisor by the name of Waddington. So he was given an honorary title of Colonel, so Colonel Waddington. Um, he did an investigation to figure out why were the planes not sinking U-boats. And among the two big conclusions he had at first were the planes were being spotted, so the U-boats had time to die, and the depth charges weren't being set at an appropriate depth for when the plane got over the U-boat and dropped the bombs. So what he did was he changed the paint scheme on the planes to go to a lighter color on the bottom of the planes. Now they got 20% closer before they were spotted, which gave them a 30% increase in the number of sinkings. But they also changed the depth charge to be instead of at a 100 foot um, setting at a 25 foot setting. And this caused more damage to the U-boat. And in the end, he created a seven fold increase in the number of U-boat sinkings. So of course he's hailed as you know, a success and everyone's happy about this. But Colonel Waddington had another point, and he said that if they really wanted to sink more U-boats, they had to do what he called force readiness. He said, you have squadrons of 40 planes, and when I was doing my investigations trying to figure this out, he said, you never had more than 20 planes flight ready. His point was that every 50 hours they went through what we today would call a PM, every 50 hours a scheduled set of maintenance activities. And he said in the first 10 hours after the scheduled maintenance activity, the number of work orders was enormous, you know, for recall on maintenance and additional things that needed fixing or checking. After 20 hours, that stack of work orders would be slightly less. After 30 hours, even less. And after 40 hours, it was the smallest pile yet. But after 50 hours, bang, it gets into another PM. So it went through the sawtooth pattern where every time it came in to go through its standard PMs, the number of work orders would increase all over again. So that's where you see the quote where he said that PM maintenance or scheduled maintenance tends to increase breakdowns. So I'm paraphrasing here, but basically he was saying the more you futz with it, the worse you make it. So this was a startling revelation, but this was during the Second World War. So information was suppressed so it wouldn't be shared by the enemy side. So this information essentially was buried. Well, about a decade later, we started getting into a lot of the civilian aircraft and a few years after that, we created an industry task force group to look into this maintenance, which at the time they called on condition. Today we called it RCM, back then they called it on condition. 
Now, over the years, there were different maintenance steering groups formed, and the first one that was formed created this giant manual of all the PM tasks related to 747 aircrafts. The second one was related to the DC-10 and the L-1011s. These were very popular aircraft at the time. Now, just to show you a quick quote from the maintenance um, side of it on the industry task force group, um, we have this um, sort of two major discoveries being identified. One is scheduled overhaul, meaning PM, that had little effect. Basically, there was an issue that unless you could identify a dominant failure mode, unless you knew consistently more times than not, how much it would or how often it would fail under a certain failure mode, doing these PMs didn't have much of an effect. They also said, and this was again very startling, that there were some things of which no form of maintenance was effective. They said it was best just to let it run. That trying to do maintenance to it didn't really give you any sort of benefits. So moving along our timeline a bit here, we now look into um, the mid-70s, and this is when the DOD commissioned United Airlines to do their study, and just a few years later, the report was published, and it had the clever title of Reliability Centered Maintenance. This was the document I was referring to earlier that identified six different failure modes, what we call the Nolan and Heap report. So Nolan and Heap put together their report and suggested that, you know, we had six categories of failure or probability of failures and a few other things, which I'll show you in just a second. But after the report came out, maintenance steering groups created a third iteration, and they went through and rewrote those manuals completely. They said, we need to do a lot less maintenance. The maintenance needs to be done the right kind at the right time. So since then, the maintenance steering group has shown that they continue to revise this document as they learn and apply a lot of that proactive maintenance as well. So moving forward here, we can see that uh, the big quote um, that I'll show you out of the Nolan and Heap report was again at trying to identify uh, two myths. So the first myth that Nolan and Heap came up with was that components could be retired or overhauled before they failed. That they showed was not true. As you can read their quote, it said, over the years it was found many types of failures could not be prevented no matter how intensive the maintenance activities were. The other myth that they debunked was that the wear out curve was popular, right? That they said the likelihood of failure increases with age, not true. And as you read the quote here, it says, despite the time honored belief that reliability was directly related to the intervals between scheduled overhauls, that just was not, not true at all. So what Nolan Heap suggested then was that we needed some clarity. And they said, one of the things that we weren't clear on was what a failure was. Without knowing what a failure is, we don't know what we should do going forward. So what they suggested was a failure is simply an unsatisfactory condition. A failure isn't necessarily that it breaks, that it fails, that it no longer functions. They said a failure is simply when it's not doing what you want it to do. So that was very, very instrumental into some of the other things they pointed out. So just to show you two more things that came out of that report was they said, Let's define failures in two categories. We have what we call a functional failure, which is when that part ceases to function the way we want it to. But the potential failure is when that part gives us an indication that it will ultimately suffer a functional failure. And notice that we have functional and potential, functional and potential. If you simply rearrange those two words in the other order, you get potential before you get the functional. And that is where we came up with a PF curve. So with the PF curve, you've probably seen it in this representation before, it's just showing that you know, based on its condition, there will always be a slight decrease in the, in the you know, condition of the machine or the asset or whatever it happens to be. And at that point, we can identify that a failure is impending. And from there, the condition takes a bit of an exponential decrease in um, the curve here as it leads towards that functional failure. So this is your standard PF curve, typical representation. Now, what we learned from these reports was that we needed to do better maintenance. And with the better maintenance, we started doing what we called reliability-centered maintenance, which heavily relied on condition monitoring or condition-based maintenance. And the big thing about these forms of condition monitoring is that ultimately you're not changing the PF curve, but what you're trying to do is shift the P to be detected sooner. 
the, the F, the functional failure, will still occur. You can't avoid that altogether, but you can try to get to the P sooner. Identify the potential for the failure. So this is why, like I said, we, we went through a bit of a revolution in, in maintenance, uh, in understanding maintenance, but the timeline's not done quite yet. With our history timeline here, one of the other major uh, times on the, the timeline is 1991, and that is when another gentleman by the name of John Mowbray published a identically uh, named report called Reliability Centered Maintenance. This book is considered the Bible of RCM. If anyone owns one book, this is the book most people recommend you buy. The Nolan and Heap report is available for free download because, of course, it's part of the public domain now that the DOD was uh, behind the publishing of it. But this is kind of the better book to follow. It's a bit more cohesively written and is intended for uh, the end users. To finish off the timeline, we had a couple of different documents from the SAE. Uh, the JA-1011, which was a series of seven questions that if you could answer those questions would guide you as to what form of maintenance strategy was best suited towards an individual machine and then the user guide towards that one. But as well, NASA published a document called Reliability Centered Maintenance Guide. And this one I've been quoting from actually quite extensively throughout this presentation. But just to pull something from Mowbray's book here, he came up with a definition for RCM. And this is absolutely fundamental. He said RCM was basically, and again, I'm paraphrasing, so I'm not reading everything here. RCM was doing whatever it took to get that asset machine, whatever it was, to work the way you wanted it to. And the point of saying whatever was necessary was at times reactive maintenance is all that's necessary, sometimes preventive, sometimes predictive, and sometimes proactive. He said it didn't matter. RCM was choosing the right maintenance strategy for each individual machine. And importantly, you didn't necessarily pick one strategy and apply it to all machines. You chose them based on certain conditions. And the NASA document does a pretty nice job summarizing those particular conditions. Basically, they say RCM isn't um, a version of proactive maintenance. It's not a fifth maintenance strategy. RCM is the umbrella over the four main maintenance strategies. And here's kind of your, your picking criteria. Reactive maintenance best applies to things that are inconsequential, not critical, inexpensive, you know, anything that sort of fits in that category. And there's a lot of things in our own household that follow this kind of mentality. You know, a toaster is a great example. You don't do any maintenance on a toaster other than clean out the crumbs. But when the toaster fails, you don't try and repair it. It's so inexpensive, you just you replace it. Right? Preventive maintenance, though, this is when you have more or less a predictable type of failure mode. Or it's got parts within it that are meant to be consumable, meant to wear out slowly over time. These types of assets are the ones that we apply preventive maintenance strategies towards. Now, predictive is usually the opposite, when you have an unexpected or unreliable type of failure modes occurring, and you can't apply the preventive maintenance to it, so now we go to predictive. We take measurements of some type to see if we can anticipate the future failure. And proactive, we tend to reserve for our high-cost items, whether that is the cost of the parts, the labor, or the downtime, but these typically are the most expensive machines in our facilities. They're the ones that cost us the most downtime, they're the ones that we're going to invest in proactive maintenance and do root cause analysis um, investigations at the conclusion of any failure because we just don't want to repeat that same failure again. So RCM has its own advantages and disadvantages. Okay? It has among the lowest parts of maintenance costs because you're only doing whatever is necessary for each individual machine as it sees fit. You are hopefully then increasing the efficiency and reliability of your plant or your operations, getting the most uptime and you've decreased the amount of absolutely catastrophic failures because you've got some proactive maintenance, of course, going on in there. Now, the disadvantage, though, is that this requires the expense of tools, training, staff, all those kinds of things. And the other point, and this is kind of a humorous one, is that the perceived value is not always readily apparent to management. Uh, the best example I can give you is if you're doing it right, then nobody knows what you're doing because if you've got as much RCM going on in your plant, you've done all the proactive maintenance where it needs to be done, you've got your predictive maintenance where that's most beneficial, you've got your PM scheduled for the things that that's the only thing they need, and you run everything else that is outside all those categories just to failure. 
people look at you and go, why do we have a maintenance department? You guys aren't doing anything. You're like, well, no, but we're doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done based on a proper assessment. So many times you're not running around, you know, fighting fires, as we often say, because you've simply prevented all fires from occurring, or at least most of them. But it is a tricky one that with a properly run RCM program, oftentimes it doesn't look like you're doing that much anymore because you've done everything hopefully ahead of time or planned for it appropriately. So the best uh, graphic I can give you to try and illustrate how RCM comes in is that generally for the first two, maybe even three years, you're actually going to have to spend a little money before you even break even. And in that spending, of course, that you know, takes money out of the coffers. But at that break point, you will start to get some return on your investment and everything after that is gravy. So this graphic kind of illustrates the sort of long tail on this one, that it takes a, a couple of years before you break even, but after that, everything else becomes a profit because what you're trying to do is shift away from all that reactive maintenance, all those unnecessary PMs, and push things towards proper condition-based predictive uh, maintenance and where appropriate do of course proactive maintenance on the big expensive stuff and PMs on the things that have the, the known reliability issues and by the end of the first two years and your break even like I said everything after that you start to make money on but all that investing you did now you get the residuals now it pays out so that's the upside of, of the uh, equation so in summary the key thing with understanding all the different maintenance strategies is that no, you're not going to pick just one. You're going to pick which one per asset. Every asset may need a different maintenance strategy from the four choices. By selectively picking from the four choices, you are in fact implementing RCM. You're deciding that this machine needs this one, that machine needs that one. Even if they're near identical machines, you can sit there and say, yeah, but that one's critical, this one isn't, or that one fails this way all the time, this one doesn't whatever your selection criteria is. You should remember though, and I did try to stress this, you're not avoiding all failures. You're simply reducing the severity of the failures. So when you start getting on this path of going towards RCM and saying, I'm letting the data tell me what to do next, I'm letting the data drive my decisions, you're not reducing the number of failures, you're just reducing the severity of the failures. Of course, this does require that you're going to be doing a lot of monitoring you may be doing a lot of PMs in there. So understand, just the severity is what we're trying to reduce here. And where appropriate, we will be requiring RCA analysis. We will need to go into a big investigation to identify why did it fail and what can we do to prevent it from failing again. Those are not fun. Like I said, nobody likes going through them, but it's meant to be a learning experience. We're trying to identify what can we do going forward to prevent us from failing the same way twice? And with all those strategies in, in place, like I said, you will be in fact using RCM and you will have let the data drive you towards your best decision. So I thank you for your time and I'll turn it over to uh, Bob now. Great, uh, thanks uh, so much Evan, a great presentation and uh, uh, we're gonna be getting to some of the questions you've submitted. If you've got questions for Evan, uh, type them in the ask a question box on your screen. The questions we don't get to today will be answered via email within a week. And remember to download a certificate of completion and the PDF copy of this presentation. Use the event resources tab on the left-hand side of your screen. We've got a number of questions uh, coming in, but the, the, the one that I wanted to start with, uh, and you didn't mention plant size at any point during your presentation today. And so one of the questions that came in, is predictive maintenance practical for a smaller facility? The short answer is yes, but let's go into a little more detail on that. Well, yeah, it, it really is not dependent on plant size at all. Whether you have a small plant or a large plant doesn't dictate whether or not you should do predictive maintenance. Ultimately, like I said, you know, the big decision is, does it have a predictable failure mode? And if it does not, that's one of the best um, you know, opportunities for applying predictive maintenance, because if it is predictable in terms of how it fails, then you don't need to take measurements, right? When we need to take measurements is when we can't anticipate through known variables like usage or mileage or hours or however we measure the runtime on a machine, we now have to take other forms of measurement. And 
you know, sometimes that sounds like, okay, well, great, but, you know, how much is that going to cost me if I have to, you know, institute a whole condition monitoring program and bring in oil analysis or vibration or ultrasonics or thermography or whatever it is. And you go, well, you know, wait a minute, you don't have to go big. Sometimes you can start with some simple things, right? You can start with a little infrared digital thermometer and start taking temperature readings. You can use existing gauges and take pressure readings or, you know, output or whatever it might be that you're measuring already and say, if I monitor these, I can still implement a predictive maintenance strategy on those particular machines. So, yeah, it doesn't have to be a big plant. It doesn't have to be a small plant. It could just be somebody with one asset, one machine, and it still may pay out to do predictive maintenance based on simply the unknown, right? Not having a reliable, a reliable failure mechanism always causing your failures. That's your justification for going ahead and instituting some form of predictive maintenance. And so it doesn't have to be expensive. Just you can work with existing data. Yeah, and I want to go back to this slide for just a second because uh, plant engineering for the last five or six years has been writing about the concept of maintenance as a profit center. Simply stated, if you can increase uptime, you can increase throughput. If you can increase throughput, that becomes the sales department's problem. So one of the things mm -hmm. that we've talked about a great deal is how do you get uh, senior management, and you talked about that, to understand that you're investing in maintenance, not spending on it. People, too many people see maintenance as a cost center rather than a profit center. And I think this slide really shows that that investment is going to pay off over a, has a long tail of payoff over a period of time. And to the point we just raised, in a small to mid-sized manufacturer, that profit is a significant amount of money. They can put that right back into R&D. They can put that into product development, into uh, staffing, a whole lot of different areas. But that money is, is enormously valuable to a small to mid-sized manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And definitely the, the big point there is that, no, there's not an immediate return on investment. It's simply buying you know, a FLIR camera or investing in a vibration analysis or oil analysis program doesn't mean that you will recoup that money in six months or a year. It could take, like I said, you know, easily two years before you even break even again. But at that point, yeah, it does become a profit. And it's one of those jokes that you often hear in industry that, you know, we pay our maintenance staff incorrectly because when do maintenance staff get paid the best? Well, when they're called in for overtime to repair something because it broke unexpectedly. And you go, well, what if you paid them based on uptime or reliability statistics of some kind? If it, people took greater ownership in their machines, well, then ultimately they would do the right kind of maintenance or be more invested in doing the right kind of maintenance ahead of time. Well, that's a great suggestion, but, you know, it's never going to fly in, in our, you know, current setup of how we employ maintenance and reliability staff. But as the management, we need to think of it from that perspective and go, it's pay me now or pay me later. And the, the, the joke, the other joke that always gets made is, if you don't plan your machine's maintenance, it will plan it for you, right? So it's, it's a matter of invest ahead of time to do the right maintenance at the right time. And in the end, that will cost you overall less than it would have had you just allowed it to fail unexpectedly or run to failure. Yeah, we, we talk about that all the time. You, you want the machine to go down on your time, not on the machine's time, because it's almost never just the cost of the parts either. I think there are, there's a misconception out there that the only maintenance cost is if a motor blows, for example, replacing the motor, that's your maintenance cost. Well, it's, you've got downtime, you've got people standing around who are not able to do any work, and was there anybody standing next to the motor when it blew? So you've got safety considerations, you've got product loss considerations. It, it's, a, it's a much bigger issue for maintenance than just whatever it is you're swapping out to, uh, to get your line back up and running. And it's a, it's a continuing challenge. And uh, we continue to write on that topic, and, and this kind of a graphic really, uh, really demonstrates that kind of a, uh, uh, of a scenario out there. Uh, our good friend Jerry Pierbolt, who from uh, uh, ESA, uh, is on the webcast today, and he says, one of the emerging trends is the combination of historical and big data with real-time condition monitoring. The related analysis and maintenance decisions are being performed remotely. Is this practice redefining some maintenance strategies? Well, definitely there's been a lot of, uh, you know, as we say, AI or Internet of Things being applied out there. And, and some of them certainly have um, had some very positive effects in making smarter decisions. 
Um, my only caution is from the side that I see working mostly with oil analysis, of course, is that as you progress, you start making improvements, much like the proactive maintenance strategy. And when you start applying some changes to how you operate or how you maintain a system, at some point you have to cut some of the data out and say, well, I can no longer use that historical data because that was under a different maintenance strategy or different program. So that's my only caution. I, I do really like it. I I've use it all the time to help understand is what I'm seeing normal or is what I'm seeing abnormal? Because again, you know, with, without looking backwards, you can't tell where you're going, you know, at times. So we do have to look at how the machine has been running and see what previous data we have, you know, from whether it's predictive technologies or just from failure uh, post-mortems. But every now and then, like I said, you, once you make a change, it basically it negates all the historical data and says, I can't use it anymore. So sometimes you kind of have to wipe that slate clean and start rebuilding, but no, certainly I agree with that, that uh, it's among the more useful tools. And it's, it's funny because it's not like it is a new thing, but I do think it went away for a period of time because there was a lot of effort during that second world war period when we're going through that second revolution, people were actually indirectly kind of doing this by looking at past failures and, and past issues and making corrections going forward. But then with the changing in the economy and all that, the manpower, in the last couple of decades, we lost a lot of that kind of expertise and started you know, making people wear many hats. And, and we sort of lost a lot of that. And we're bringing it back, which is great. But sometimes we bring it back and we think that it's a new thing. It's not really that new. But no, it is. That's a good question. That's uh, definitely important. Yeah. And we, we see a great deal of that, obviously, as we move toward a more data-driven process. But with the work you do at test oil, do you really do you see a lot of uh, people not knowing what they don't know type of uh, uh, maintenance that we we do this by either by a clipboard or even even a, a, a Excel spreadsheet or a, a reminder on your Outlook calendar, whatever it might be. The idea of, of doing maintenance when it needs to be done rather than when the calendar tells you it needs to be done is that a, that's a big change for a lot of. Uh, a, a lot of your customers, I would think, at least at the first the first time you you work with them. Yes, oh, for sure. There's there is a lot of that. Um, you know, it's it's the classic uh, story of you know, the, what are the seven most damaging words in the industry? We have always done it that way. Right? You know, that people just follow follow some type of schedule and say, well, I've always changed it this way, or I've always done this to it, and. You know, and from an oil analysis side, one of the common things I get is, you know, people buying aftermarket additives and going, well, I've always used this, it's always worked. And I always ask them, I said, well, have you ever tried not using it? Do you know it's actually making a difference? Like, how are you basing these decisions? And again, you know, it's one of those things that we've seen that we're, we're losing and regaining is that, you know, as, as workforce has shrunk and now we're starting to build them back up, uh, you know, we're having to relearn a few things because we don't have that expertise and now we've got, you know, quite a young workforce going in. And some of them are asking a lot of questions, which is good. You know, it's, it's not necessarily looking for a different answer. It's simply understanding why do we do things the way we do? Should we do it differently? Is there a better way? And, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask is what I always say. It doesn't mean you have to yeah. change, but you should at least ask the question to find out why are we performing maintenance this way? Was that a logical decision or have we just fallen into some kind of rut? Well, I think I think why is the is the next great question in manufacturing, and we're getting a lot of those kind of questions. I think we'll we'll uh, uh, end it on that note because I think that's where uh, that, that's a good question for everybody to ask themselves as we head on out today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Evan Zabowski from Test Oil for his time and expertise today, and I also want to thank our uh, sponsors, Proof Technic and Desk Case, uh, for sponsoring today's event. And now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends, and please take a moment uh, to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcasts. So on behalf of uh, Evan Zabowski from Test Oil, I'm Bob Vaver. On behalf of Plant Engineering and our sponsors today, Proof Technic and Desk Case, I want to thank you for attending. This concludes this afternoon's webcast. Thanks, and have a wonderful afternoon.